All right, this section 4.3, we're going to be taking a look at two factors. Um, one is called greatest common divisors, and the other is called least common multiples. Um, our goal will be to cover the greatest common divisors part today, and then we'll do least common multiples on Friday. So greatest common divisor, um, or sometimes called a greatest common factor, is the greatest whole number that divides all numbers in your set. Greatest whole number that divides all numbers in your set. Um, one more definition, and we've actually seen this happen, and in fact we saw it happen on your very last question from section C, the last section, number 14. Relatively prime. Relatively prime are two or more numbers whose greatest common divisor is one, i.e. they have no common factors other than one. So it doesn't mean that the numbers themselves are prime. In fact, neither one of them have to be prime to make this work. They could be, but they don't have to be but it means that they have nothing in common with one another. So the one that we just saw a moment ago was if we take 12, um, oh wait, no, I'll write it down this way. We had three and four, they were the numbers that made 12. Three and four are considered relatively prime. Why? Because their greatest common divisor is one. Nothing divides them except for the number one. So a non-example, would be the number six and two that we just saw. This one has a greatest common divisor that's actually the number two. So then we wouldn't call the two and the six relatively prime. Even though two is prime, six is not. Three is prime, four is not. So it's not the individual number's ability to be or not be prime. It's whether or not when you consider them together, they divide by anything, okay? So a greatest common divisor is just the biggest number that divides things. So on the first one, it's a one. There's always a greatest common divisor. There's always the ability that one will divide something, right? But it could be bigger than that. It could be two or it could be something larger than that. So what we're gonna spend the rest of today doing is actually looking at ways to find greatest common divisors. Um, and they work well at different points in curriculum. Um, there's probably some that you're more familiar with because they extend into algebra a little bit better. Um, and so you might be like, oh yeah, I remember that one. And some of these earlier ones, you're like, I don't remember doing it that way. And that's kind of why, is because they, they lose the ease of effectiveness um, on some of, the fa of these, these ways of doing it. But in their own right, they all work. Okay, so the first one is called the intersection of sets method. In this method, what you do is you list all the divisors of each value, and you simply pick the largest one that they have in common. Okay, list them all, pick the biggest. Okay, this works really well for small numbers. Um, it works really well for numbers that don't divide by a lot of stuff as well, okay? Or numbers that are somewhat familiar to you to be able to do the division easily. Okay, so we're going to do an example with uh, numbers that are able to be done nicely with this, 12 and 15. Now, we've seen these numbers before and talked about ways of finding factors, and we've talked about the fact that factors come in pairs. So as we list them, if we list them in pairs, it'll be most helpful. In fact, I think I'll move my 15 over to the side, and we'll list them from top to bottom. So we can always do the 1 times 12 as two factors. What's the next number that would divide 12? if we're going in order from one up? Two. Two and six, yes. What's the next number for? Three. three and four, and there's no more space between three and four, so we're done. All right, so 15, we would start with the one and 15. Then what? Three and five. And it stops there. So of all the numbers that are currently listed on my screen, the ones I've written in, which one is the biggest that match from the lists? Three. Three is the largest number in both lists, so the greatest common divisor is one, uh, three, sorry, three. I'm trying to fix my G. Okay, so this works great when the numbers are small, right? It works great when you find all the factors really easily, um, but there are some numbers for which you would have a harder time finding factors, or you might have to find a really long list of factors, and this might not be a great approach. The next one is the one that usually extends into algebra the most. Um, oh, I'm sorry, it was there. It was on my next screen. All right, this one. I'm sorry, I just didn't switch my screen. Prime factorization. 
prime factorization method, you construct the prime, prime factorization for each number. Secondly, you choose all prime factors that are common to each factorization. You list each prime with the smallest exponent in any of factorization. <coughs> and then you find the product of the values. Um, this extends nicely into algebra because it's obvious how it works when you get to variables. Variables look a little bit less direct when you're looking at this other method over here that we had done. It's not quite as clear what's going on. So we're going to do numbers that are a little bit bigger. Prime factorization method works better for bigger numbers than the previous one does. Now we looked at ways of finding factorizations in section 4.2. We made trees, right, that went down. And we also did this division algorithm that went down. I'm going to go with the division algorithm moving forward. That's the one that I like the best. But if you like trees, feel free to do a tree. It's not going to hurt my feelings at all, OK? So we're going to do the 400 first. And remember, our goal is to look for the smallest prime factor of 400, which would be 2. What is 400 divided by 2? 200 which will divide by 2 again to give me 100, and again to give me, and again to give me 25. Now it no longer divides by 2. What's the next prime factor that divides 25? 5, and we get 5. So our prime factorization from section 4-2, when we did this before, is that there's four twos and two fives. So I have 2 to the fourth times five squared. And we'll do the same thing for our second number, which was 360. Well, 360 divided by two to give me close 180, yep. Which will divide by two to give me, which will divide by Two to give me 45, which will divide by, it does divide by 5, but there's something that divides by 4 at first. Yeah, it divides by 3. What's 45 divided by 3? 15. The only thing that would happen if you put the 5 first is that it just wouldn't be in order. It wouldn't hurt anything. You're still dividing by a prime, but it just wouldn't be in order. 15 will divide by 3, and then I'll end up with a 5. So my prime factorization includes how many twos? Two. So three twos, so two to the third. How many threes? Two. So three squared and a five. Okay, so <laughs> the reality is step one is all we've done. It's the hardest step. The steps afterwards are easy, okay? So step one is all the work. Step two is analyzing the answers that we got at the bottom. So what step two says is we're going to choose all the prime factors they have in common. So looking at the bases... Which ones do they have in common? Two and, two and five. Okay, so my greatest common divisor will include a two. Oh, that's a D. I missed one. A two and a five. I have students stop here all the time. This is not the stopping point, though. We need exponents on there. At least we potentially need exponents on there. Okay? So step three tells us to use the exponent that's the smallest. So looking at the number two, this one's got two to the fourth. The other one's two to the third. Which one's the smallest? Mm -hmm. 2 to the 3rd, so I'm going to do 2 to the 3rd. Looking at this one, I've got 5 squared. Over that one, I have 5 to the 1, so my 5 will be to the 1. Yeah. You have to actually write a 1. You don't have to. Uh, I'm just going to write it right now so that we make sure that when you look back later, you see what we chose. And it might not even be a bad idea to put the 1 up here to just as a reminder to yourself. So why would we not just pick the 5 since it's a bigger number? Because like it needs to be everything that divides it. Two will divide both of these numbers. Five will divide both of these numbers. We want to include everything that divides both numbers. Oh, I didn't and we're not know. quite finished yet with it still. But so on example one, if there would have been, like say there was a number two, like say two divided into 15, we uh -huh. would write two and three. Well, in this one, it doesn't work like that. The reason we didn't need to worry about it here is because let's say 2 and 3 both divided him, then 6 would have been in your list already. So 
So, um, like, if I had, uh, let me come up with another example. Let's see if we can do one. Let's do one of the numbers we already have, 12, because then we have, uh, I don't have to recreate everything. One, two, six, three, four. Um, and let's do, um, 20 will work. Let's pretend the other number's 20. So we have 1 and 20, 2 and 10, and 4 and 5. So the 2s are in the lists, right? Mm -hmm. But 4 is also in the list. So 4 is going to be my greatest common divisor. It's just the biggest one of all the divisors. But if I broke these down the way I just did a minute ago um, in that other example, and I broke them down and did it like this, We would have had 2 squared times 3 and 2 squared times 5. We would say, hey, they both divide by 2, but not just by 2. It's not only 2. They divide by 2 squared. And if they had something else they divide by, we include that 2. They don't and mind the ones that I just created. But that's why we're using exponents, and that's why we're writing multiple things, is that they divide by lots of things in common, and this one would have. Um, the last step is to multiply the 2 cubed times 5 out. So 2 cubed is 8. And 8 times 5 would be what? 40. Close. 40. 40. So 40, so like if I wrote these out, Kaylee, the way that I just did in that previous example, mm -hmm. I'd have lots of places where they would have things that are in common, but 40 would be the biggest number they'd have in common in that list. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The next one's my favorite. Mm -hmm. right. I know. I have favorites, too. <laughs> um, it doesn't necessarily extend quite as well as the last one into algebra, um, but I like this one quite a lot. Uh, this one's called division by primes. So you write the numbers in a row and you divide each of the numbers by a common prime factor. Then you divide the quotients by a common prime factor and you repeat and you repeat and you repeat all the division until they don't have anything in common anymore. And then your greatest common divisor is the product of the primes. So what it does is it actually takes this kind of an idea and it merges it with the last one looking for things they have in common kind of at the same time. So let me take a look with you. Um, our example is 410 and 360 now. So we put them in a row, which means we look like this. We do like this. And we write the division by primes, much like I wrote the division with the prime factorization method in the previous slide. But instead of just looking for what divides the smallest number that divides 410, it has to divide 410 and 360. And it would be a 2, right? So what is 410 divided by 2? Mm-hmm, 2 of 5. How about 360 divided by 2? We did this one a minute ago. 180. 180. Can we repeat? So we'd still look at 2. Is 2, two going to divide both of these? Nope. How about 3? No. 5. Yes, 5 will divide them. So what is 2 of 5 divided by 5? 41. And what is 180 divided by 5? 36. Okay, so 41 and 36. Do they divide again by 5? No. no. 7? No. 11? No. We're done. 41 is actually prime. If you didn't know it, that's okay. But it's actually prime. 36 has lots of things that divide it, um, but nothing that divides the 41. So we stop. The reason I like this method is because I don't end up needing to do all the massive division because I'm just looking for the things that are in common. Whereas over here, I gotta do it all before I can decide what they have in common. Here, I'm looking for what they have in common as I go. The solution then is the product of the primes that you divided by. So this one would be the greatest common divisor would just be the number 10. Now, I'd like to show you, since we did this problem before with the 400 and the 30, what it would, 360, excuse me, what it would have looked like if I'd done division by primes. 
I would have still done a lot of the same divisions. 2 would give me 200 here and 180. 2 again would give me 100 and 90. 2 again would give me 50 and 45. 2 doesn't work. 3 doesn't work. But 5 does. 5 would give me 10 and 9. And 10 and 9 are relatively prime. They don't have anything in common. And then my solution is just over here. So compare that to all the work for this. This is a lot more work, right? And that alone is why I like this one better, is because we can do those looking for pieces that are in common as we go. And we have the 2 cubed times 5, or the 40. Yes, it's a multiplication. All right, any questions on that one? Would you go back to the steps? Sure. Okay. There is one last algorithm. Um, it is not super intuitive of why it works. It looks very clever, um, but it feels like a little bit like hand-waving magic-y. Um, I uh, watched a student teacher teach something the other day that I've never seen taught before. I'll tell you what it is after we're done with class, but um, it felt like that. It felt like, well, that's a really cool thing to do, huh? You know, uh, it, that's what math sometimes feels like. I feel like this is in that category, so let me show that to you. This one is called the Euclidean algorithm. Now, you've heard the word Euclidean before. You've heard it with geometry, Euclidean geometry. That's geometry you did in high school. That's what it's called. Euclid was a mathematician, and he's credited with our geometry the way that we do it, okay? Euclidean geometry. He's also credited with this one, or his name wouldn't be on it, right? The Euclidean algorithm. So the first step is you divide the larger number by the smaller one. Okay, we can do that. You divide the previous divisor by the remainder, and you repeat step two until you get a remainder of zero. The last divisor is the greatest common divisor. And I even feel like just writing the steps down makes it sound kind of like when we did the rule for divisibility by 11. You're like, huh? There was a lot of terminology on the pieces of information right here. But when you put it into action, it's not a hard thing to do. It's just a little bit mysterious as to why it works. So we're going to take a look. We're going to do 72 and 126. The first step's pretty straightforward. It said divide the biggest number by the smallest number. I can start with that language, no problem. So I've got 126 underneath. I've got 72 on the outside. Um, and what we really care about is we really care about the remainder. So go ahead and grab your calculator. I want you to figure out how many whole number times 72 goes into 126. One. one. And then one times 72 would be 72. So we subtract what's our remainder. What was it? Fifty-four is right. Okay, so that's step one. Every step afterwards takes the number you divided by and the remainder and it does it again. Okay, so we're gonna take 72, which is now our bigger number, and it goes underneath. And the 54 goes on the outside. So how many 54s are there in 76? One, they're not always gonna go in just one time, by the way, this one just did. And I subtract and I get what? It's 72. Oh, I wrote down the wrong number, I'm sorry. Thank you for catching that. 72 is what it's supposed to say, yes. Okay, what is 72 minus 54? 18. Okay, everybody good? All right, so we're gonna do the 18 and the 54. So 54 underneath, 18 on the outside. How many times will 18 go into 54? Three, and what's three times 18? It's actually 54 this time. So this being zero tells us that we stop. So this one says stop here, okay? And then the last number we divided by is our greatest common divisor.
So I feel like we're going to need to see one more, and we have time. This is our last thing we're going to do anyway. So we're going to do that same 400 and 360 we did a minute ago, okay? We're going to see that this method gives us the same answer one more time. So I'm going to use 400 and oh, let me move this over a little bit and divide by 360. It's always the bigger number divided by the smaller one. So what, how many times does 360 go into 40? One, one time. What is one times 360? Mm-hmm. Now if I subtract, what do I get? 40. Okay, so I take the divisor and the quotient, okay? So what I, di what I divided by, I didn't mean the quotient, I meant the remainder. The what I divided by, that's my 360. And I divide it by the remainder, which is 40. And how many times does 40 go into 360? Nine. Nine, Nine times 40 is? 360. 360. Zero means I stop. And the last number I divided by is my GCD. So it may feel a little bit mysterious, but it, on this one anyway, that was the shortest way to do it, wasn't it? It took two steps. Okay, let's do the 410 and 360, and then we'll be, we'll be done for today. So almost identical numbers, but I think it'll take us a couple more steps. 410 divided by 360. How many times will 360 go into 410? One time. And when I subtract, what do we get? 50. Okay, so I take a 50 and the 360. 360's under the house, 50's on the outside. How many 50's are there in 360? Seven times 50 is? 350, giving me a remainder of 10. Then I take 10 and 50, 10 on the outside, 50 underneath. How many 10s are in 50? And 5 times 10 is 50. Zero means I stop. So the last number is my GCD. What do you think? Okay. It's very simple. The process itself is super simple, but I mean, are you with me that I can't write it in a nice way? There's just not a really good way to write it. It's one of those things that if you see where the numbers are shifting to, it's not so bad, but to write it down is a little bit confusing.